Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BH event space. You are tuned to an episode here of In Conversation. Today we're speaking with photographer Jason Gardner. Jason, I'd like to welcome you on onto the program. How's it going? Good. Well, I'm well. Thanks, Derek, for having me. It's good to have you back. I know last time we had you on, I wasn't in the seat and the project wasn't completed. So this is kind of like a, a full circle moment for you Definitely. talking about your your latest project, We the Spirit. So we're excited to have you on. I want to thank you once again. No problem. It's really it's great to be uh, working with the team again. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, let's dive right in. For those of you out yep. there who uh, are are watching, are listening, maybe your first time on our program, you do have any questions. We don't always get to them, but in this case, if you do have something that you want to throw in, any questions or comments, we always like to do here uh, the engagement that you guys have with the program. But Jason, I want to dive in, and uh, you know, when we talked in in a pre chat, you had mentioned the origin story. You know, like this comic book kind of thing of. <laughs> Where did it all begin? So for you, where did the journey begin? Yeah, so I've been a photographer for about 20 years. Um, I'm from New York, but I'm currently based in Paris. But when I um, when I was starting out, um, I actually didn't go to school for photography. I'm self-taught. Um, and uh, before I became a photographer, I kind of traveled all around the world, uh, left my job when I was 25 and backpacked for like two years straight and took a lot of photos with my little Konica Z up uh, and film camera. When I came back, I was kind of like, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And, and I kept on going back to photography. And so I kind of fell in love with the, the image and I started just, you know, I'd shot a lot of landscapes, but um, I really wanted to get into the idea of stories and portraiture. And um, when I started professionally, you know, the, like they say about writing, um, you do what you love. So I started photographing music and musicians. That was my first love. And I started uh, photographing you know, independent musicians and then larger musicians. And I shot for music magazines and covers. And I shot for Celebrate Brooklyn and in, 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 uh, the, the band Shell. I, I photographed uh, Bob Dylan and Isaac Hayes and all this stuff. And um, as I started showing the work to a wider audience beyond the music industry, people said, we want to see a personal project. We want to see something that with your personal vision. And so I thought, OK, um, music uh i love to travel um i never did been to brazil let's go to brazil and do a project on traditional musicians right it was kind of that simple um and so i did a lot of research in advance i kind of um i talked to all anyone who'd been to brazil i talked to any brazilian musicians then i started talking with ethnomusicologists and they said you could go to rio that's very well known you go to bahia which is in the northeast of brazil that's also well known but consider going to recife in pernambuco uh, which is also in the Northeast, but it's a less known, but very authentic and kind of folkloric and deep um, culturally uh, region. And so I did. And um, the first time I went, it was kind of off season and I took some photos of a couple groups that I'd been connected to and did some portraiture and, and these things. And they said, after a couple of weeks, they said, oh, you have some good photos. We have to come back during carnival. Carnival is when everything happens um, in January and February, you know, this is sort of season. And so I did a few months later, and um, that became, in, in the, the long run, uh, my first book after going there, four different carnivals, five visits over eight years. So in that process, I kind of went deeper and deeper and deeper in one place, in one region. Um, every time I return, it's kind of like peeling back an onion, kind of going deeper and deeper in there, um, you know, because carnival is such a wide ranging, uh, everything happens in, in a very short time, a few weeks, um, you know. I would go back to, I would go to one place and I would discover there's three other things happening at the same very time. So the, the next second year I went to these other things. And then what had happened was that as I kept returning, and we'll see the images in a second, um, you know, people started to say, oh, you're, you know, there, there's a big difference between being, as they say, like a helicopter photographer, just parachuting in for a few days and then leaving, never coming back versus returning a lot. Right. And so I started bringing the photos and showing it to people and giving it to them as well. And they said, oh, you have a nice archive, but you're missing something. Come back next Saturday. I'll show you this. And they took me in the favela, 45 minutes walking. You know, they said, you know, you can't really come here by yourself. Not that it's unsafe because it was unsafe, but it was just like a respect thing. You know, this is like our neighborhood. and You can't just kind of walk in here without being with someone. And so I started photographing ceremonies and sort of behind the scenes rituals and practices and all sorts of stuff. So um, that became the sort of rich texture of, of the, the first book. And then um, 
when I flash forward to 2016, when I moved to France with my wife, um, she had got, got a job and I figured why not, you know, establish my freelance career in Europe as well. I started exploring Carnival and other places um, after after that. We'll, we'll get to the images now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so a flower in the mouth was that that was your introduction to kind of that whole world, to that cultural side of you exploring your personal work. Yes. Um, you know, a flower in the mouth project was the whole, uh, was a deep dive into the sort of carnival culture. In fact, even when I was in New York, I started exploring like the years I couldn't go to carnival um, in Brazil. You can't go to Brazil every year. I, I said, okay, well, what's Louisiana like in my own country? What's, you know, Caribbean like a little closer, Trinidad, Tobago, uh, Dominican Republic, the sort of things. Um, and not only in Louisiana did I go to obviously New Orleans, that's a big Mardi Gras, but um, uh, and, and in New Orleans, there's a whole bunch of sub, uh, subcultures of carnival, different slices of, you know, it's not just, um, Bourbon street and Frenchman street and this, the, the very, very, um, public and known carnival. There's all this sort of subtextures. There's, there's obviously the African-American, uh, they're called Mardi Gras Indians. Now they're called black masking Indians. And there's a whole set of artist carnivals. That's kind of like a little bit more underground and, and a little bit, you have to know where it is and all that stuff. And I also went to in Louisiana to Cajun country, which is a whole different, it's a rural Louisiana experience. Um, and we'll get to that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'd love to see some images yeah. and it kind of yeah, helps set some context for uh, why we're here today. Yeah, for sure. Let me, let me get to that screen share and, and start rocking it. Let me see, just testing. This is the cover. Can you see it? Okay. Yep. See it just now. Checking. Okay. So that's the cover of the first book of flower in the mouth. And the subtitle is The Beauty and the Burden of Carnival in Pernambuco, Brazil, because it wasn't just a beautiful thing. What I discovered was that the, the, the carnival goers, they worked really hard. They practiced all year. They sewed the costumes. They kind of organized their calendar around. It was my first peek into this sort of um, uh, you know, obsession that these people had with it. It wasn't just a party that they kind of put on a random costume and they party for a day and that's it. It was a whole way of life. Just wanted to make sure that I said that. So yeah, in Recife, um, this is like one of the main carnival scenes. I know this is not comped up. Um, these floating things are floating from the from these sort of rooftop uh, um, uh, trees. It's a little bit surreal. People think I comped it in because it's very flat. Uh, but yeah, it's it's really about the music and the the streets and um, the carnival here. In comparison to what a lot of people might know from the media stereotypes of Rio, which is this big stadium, its whole production, it's very um, relatively small and all very street level. Um, and you can really get in there. Um, and, you know, showing that you saw the band before, these are the kind of dolls that are in these small streets. This is Odinda, which is near Recife. How long did um, it take you to get explored... How long sorry. did it take you to get immersed? I'm sorry. I just wanted just to set like, were you comfortable going in or did you kind of just go in and this was you getting your footing as you're beginning this um a little bit of both i mean the essence of carnival is is actually you're not you're never really comfortable um because there's a lot going on and it's a very intense time there's a lot of people and you know you kind of have to um be careful um and not be careful uh security wise but you just you know always looking out you're not just in a comfort zone um did it, how long did it take me to get immersed Probably after that that first initial trip, and then I started had some contacts and had an idea of what to do. The first carnival, uh, which is the second trip, um, it, in a day I was immersed. I mean, you, you, everything's happening all the time, and so you you get to be, you're you're shooting day and night basically. Perfect. I hope that answered. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is the city, and this is the city, but um, this is the countryside, and this is a different type of carnival. This is the rural carnival, and. Um, a few things. The, the title is called The Flower in the Mouth because these guys, the Caboclo de Lanza, they put the flower in their mouth because of two or three things. They're, it's their connection with nature. It's um, It sort of gets them in the mood for this sort of burden because if you can see here, um, these guys, this is, the, this is in Brazilian summer in February. It's super hot. And they're they're weighed down by these bells um, that you might hear later later on. Um, but it all weighs about thirty or forty kilos, and it's major thing. So it's quite hot, and it's a very physical um, carnival. And they also put the flower in their mouth because it, it symbolizes beauty. And these guys um, in the countryside are, in general, they're cane cutters. I mean, they're very masculine, strong guys, but. Uh, during carnival, they kind of show a different side. They show their beautiful side and their feminine side. Um, and that's a bit of a close-up of a flower-in-the-mouth guy, Caboclo de Lanza. 
but also there's a lot of, I started doing a lot of portraiture of, of the carnivals, um, showing a little bit of kind of something different. And this is, is that kind of, of what, where, moment. where your interest lean, leaned was towards the people. Yes, you could say that. I mean, you know, there's the, there's the carnival ritual and the, the parade on the streets. There is, um, you know, sort of the significance of the carnival, like, what does it mean ethnographically? But then on the, on the very grassroots level, it's like the people themselves, what does it mean to them? Um, when you see it from those three perspectives, it becomes more deep than just a, a party. Um, I also photographed a lot the Monica too, which is in the main city. And that's a Afro-Brazilian connection uh, using a lot of percussion, a lot of drums. But um, there's a, and it's often the, the sort of less, like sort of poorer neighborhoods in the favela who are representing these Monica too. And in Carnival, this is the first time I saw this inversion where um, they put all their savings into these cortege, which is like they become this whole, there's a whole um, royal procession, a king, a queen, a prince, and this is the queen. And she's queen of the procession, but she's also, she does all the work um, and in kind of sewing uh, and preparing all the costumes for 150 people at least. Um, and so she, it's not just her, she has a few people helping her, but um, she was also the main titular head of the uh, religious aspect, which is in the in the main temple, and and so she showed me some of these things like um, uh, the this um, I guess you could say shrine with multiple different um, uh, influences. So you kind of have Jesus, and you have Zepilintra, which is this kind of condomle um, syncretic thing. And you've got these angels, and you know, in different months, and that you have an Indian kind of Native American over here, um, and you have all these different um, iconography. And um, I just thought that was fascinating. And so I explored more of the ceremonial side. This is called a cleaning ceremony where they write the names of the relatives that they want the Odisha, the gods to, to take care of during carnival. So they take the eggs and they break on them, they blow on them. And it's a whole, I mean, some of these rituals I was invited to is like eight hours in an unmarked house, um, all these things. Um, uh, this is another ritual um, where it's just smoking tobacco, but you know, man becomes woman. I see this sort of inversion, these, sort of themes started to come out, which we'll see also in the second book, which is We the Spirits. Uh, so um, uh, this book is a collection of 15 different countries photographed over 15 years, um, not in, not including Brazil. The Brazil book is the first book. Um, and uh, as I said, the years I couldn't go to Brazil when I was based in New York, this is Trinidad and Tobago. And you know, when people think Trinidad, they think like Rio, a lot of bikinis and um, feathers and sequins and beautiful things. But this is the Blue Devils of Paramin, which is like a, um, a little bit away from Port of Spain. And they kind of blow fire and it, it, it's, it's, on, it's on the evening side, it's on the dark side of Carnival. And so it's the first time I was seeing that um, theme of dark and light, of chaos and beauty. And we'll, we'll get to more of that in a minute. Uh, I also did, this is the, from uh, Louisiana, the Cajun country, and this is, I call the chicken man, um, what they, this is called courir in French, which means to run, and they call it to run because what they do is they ceremoniously release the chicken and the carnival participants chase after it and catch it to symb symbolically put it in the gumbo for everyone to eat. So because carnival is a transition between winter and spring, usually in February, um, this this is a heart. This harks back to an homage to the older days of pre-refrigeration, when winter time was when everyone would in the village would put something into the pot so we'd all eat and, and to kind of get through the winter. Right, that's the idea. Also in New Orleans, um, uh, as I mentioned, there's a few different segments of carnival. This is the more artist carnival. It looks like Day of the Dead Mexico, but it's uh, but this is right on uh, right off Frenchman Street. And uh, yeah, the black masking Indians. And that's a whole other thing. And a lot of people who may have seen the show, HBO show Treme, um, I photographed these guys uh, before that show came out. But uh, in, in essence, the um, it's uh, for those who don't know, um, it's African-Americans who sew a new suit every year. Um, and they the, this tradition is passed down from father or son or people who just want to learn. It's all an oral tradition. And um, it's usually an homage of the African-Americans for the um, Native Americans who in the 1800s 
harbored escaped slaves and helped them. Um, and it's now a very strong uh, sense of identity for them. Um, and you, you won't see the black masking Indians on Bourbon Street um, that much, if at all. Um, it's, it's really only in the African-American neighborhoods. And um, there's a whole subculture. There's different, um, what's the word? There's different um, roles. There's a spy boy, a flag boy. Um, there's the big chief. There's the queen. You know, and each one has a specific role within the parade. So it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Um, when I moved to Europe, I started exploring France. This is a France carnival in North in Dunkirk. I also went to Sardinia and Italy, and this is a lot more. This reminds me of the Muses with the the string, um, the the that who measures the string of life. The Greek Muses. Uh, Sardinia is not far from Greece. And this guy told me, um, you know, in an interview, because I did some interviews with, when I could, um, he said, when I wear this mask, I can never die. When I wear this mask, I connect to 10, 100, 1,000 generations before me. So I really started to get the sense, especially in Europe, of this old festival that uh, was frankly pre-Christian and pagan that had been, you know, kind of continued into modern day. Uh, this is also Sardinia. And I also went to Guinea-Bissau in West Africa, uh, showing a couple different, both in the city and then the islands, which is this shot. Um, and you can see the iconography of the boat and um, and this huge um, uh, wooden mask, which takes a few people to put it on. And these these wooden masks are not made new every year. They're kind of, you know, fixed up every year and, and augmented, uh, but they're also fascinating. Uh, now we're in Slovenia, and this is... Um, there's a bunch of these, uh, Slovenia went deep in, in for a few weeks uh, in one year. Um, obviously the flowers in here, it's the, the connection with um, with springtime. And there's a few other things there. These guys uh, circle up in front of the yard and, and visit from house to house. And the circling that they do is sort of um, reminiscent and, and sort of ethnographically, I guess, um, of the you know, sort of plowing the fields for fertility. A lot of these um, rites are for good harvest, for seeing the transition between winter and spring. And fertility could also be, you know, connected to not just the fields, but the populace, the, the women, you know. Um, there's a very, in Slovenia, there's a very, um, uh, what's the word? It's a very um, sort of almost comic, uh, This, but also this is like a dualism is the man, the woman who carries the man in the basket. Um, and there's this fearsome, uh, the Kurenti, which is the most well-known of Slovenia um, icon of carnival. And they have this big red tongue and have these tusks and they're kind of fearsome, but also cuddly. Um, marriages are a big thing in carnival. So marriages also represent renewal and rebirth. And in this village, when, uh, you know, carnival time is the time for when marriages occur. If there's no marriage scheduled, then they do a kind of mock marriage and two unwed boys visit from house to house as like the bride and groom. And this visiting from house to house is also a theme where there's kind of, um, it's almost like caroling um, where that comes from a little bit. Death, that's a part of carnival for sure. And this is here in Poland, the... I found it interesting, the very traditional carnival uh, costume of the sort of guy in rags. And then he adds this modern touch of the sort of advertising on top there to be a little bit uh, rebellious. And uh, a lot of people, when they see my work, um, because they have seen so much of Brazil images and to some extent um, Venice and a couple other places, they're surprised to see carnival in the snow, you know, and and just to, as a one more comment, I keep on saying carnival. Um, carnival, people say, well, how do you photograph so many uh, and you only have a couple days during Mardi Gras? Well, it's really the winter masquerade. And, and it's that, that season is widened to Day of the Kings, um, which is the 6th of January, all the way through the end of Lent. So there's a lot of different carnivals that happen in those times. Um, and some don't even call them the carnival, but for the purposes of my project, I focused on the winter masquerade that had these sort of elements of inversion and sort of subversion, transcendence, and um, these sort of deep themes that keep on resonating um, throughout. So here we are in Austria, and I'm actually showing, I'm starting to show now um, some of the, the parallels in, in different countries. So this is Austria, and this is Slovenia, right? So it's sort of like, you know, 
country. These guys are are Kramer's men, which means sort of like junk man. That it's the parody of these guys who go from house to house um, in the olden days selling junk, you know, selling household items. And this is like the old man and the old farmer man and and, and wife icon. So there's all these stereotypes there, uh, you know, that they are making parodies of, um, but also sort of representing. This, a lot of people say that it's like sort of looks African, but it's also from Slovenia. These are the, the thread men in, in a different carnival. And now when I say carnival in Slovenia, you know, this is a small country, but it has, you know, maybe 10 or 12 different regions um, that have completely different manifestations of this festival, different look of feel of the costumes. Um, and these guys are the ones who kind of keep the order and they take their sticks and they whack people out of the way of the parade. And so these next few images, there's a certain tonal range um, that's quite similar, but they're very different countries. This is North Macedonia. This is another bride, in quotes. And by the way, everything here is square and everything is film. I shot with a Mamiya 6. Um, I shot it with a uh, slide film, which is a very low gamut of uh, Provia 100, a uh, very low gamut of, uh, you know, kind of stops. You have one or one or two stops, plus or minus. Um, and but that gives it a very analog this kind of look. Um, it's not none of the images are perfect and there's a sort of gritty feel, but uh, it's kind of my style and I like it. Well, this is in northern Greece, and here we're back in um, uh, in Austria. Um, this is a village that does uh, their carnival once every five years. So you know, in every every carnival year it, it rotates to another village, but you know, it's quite an intense day, like everything building up to one day. And we're back in Poland, these sort of horse iconography where they're dancing around and uh, and uh, and there's two of them. Uh, yeah, so animals. So we have horses here. We have chickens here. This is Galicia. Um, the animals are a key um, icon in a lot of these carnival images because it symbolizes a little bit of man's relationship with the animal and dependence on, especially in the rural environment for you know, obviously for food and for beast of burden and all these things. So, you know, animals and nature are really strong uh, um, themes here. So this is in Galicia in Spain, in Northwest Spain. Also in Galicia, there's also the sense of sort of prettiness. These are actually called the bonita, which means beautiful. And there's also a little bit of fearsome, more animals. So this is in Spain as well, but central Spain. I love also the sneakers on the bottom here, this sort of touch of modernity. And more more animals, but now we're in, in Germany, and this is the goat. See the horns there? And a bull here. And Bulgaria, this is a cow head guy. And another cowhead, but we're back in Guinea-Bissau. So, you know, cows and these sort of bulls and all these things with the horns, um, they're obviously a, a symbol of strength, but also virility. And so all, all these things are super important to them, how they show and make an homage to these things that are important in their life. <clears throat> but then also, uh, this is Basque country. Um, they have to have a sort of scary... Vulcan. This is like the, the parody of the fat man, but also um, it's quite quite fearsome. Um, now we're in, this is from last year's imagery, um, which was right before the, the book came out. Um, this is um, in Italy uh, near Lake Como. It's a little town that does um, and sort of the beautiful and the ugly. And this is the ugly and they have this sort of rags and they show and they, and they try to clean your shoes, but they actually are cleaning with dirty water. So, you know, they make it worse. You know, it's a little bit of comic relief. And this is the beautiful, right? So this is like the rich, uh, uh, they're, they're very fat. They have like very ornate fans and, you know, all these things. And so it's kind of like just showing the sort of two sides of the, their experience there. Um, and now here we're in, in uh, Germany. And um, this is an interesting village because this is a wood shavings bin. And a lot of people think that it might be even Japan because these sort of the masks almost look kabuki, but... Um, this is a tradition that had been going for hundreds of years, but was lost and was recently revived. I say recently, like I want to say the 50s, 60s, 70s. 
um, in, into this tradition. And, and it's a um, tradition that's spread out over many different villages in a region. And luckily enough, I was there for when they kind of three or four groups came together. And um, I use this by saying, when if people ask, what's your process? Do you kind of, how do you, do you make appointments with them? I never make an appointment with them. Um, I bring very little uh, in terms of gear. I have no assistance. I do only ambient light. And I never, my process is never to interrupt the ritual, right? So it's either before they go out in the parade or after. Um, my sweet spot usually is when they get dressed uh, before they go. This is the field right next to the shack where they got dressed. Then I kind of get a, a chance to take a photo. But of course, in, inherent in that, because they're rare, they're well dressed, they're raring to go. Each photo shoot is about 30 to 60 seconds, maybe five minutes at max. You know, so I, I have to quickly compose and I, I rarely um, scout before. Uh, I, sometimes I do, but uh, um, I have to kind of, I, I do it that way. And I don't mind doing a very quick photo shoot because it kind of doesn't uh, interrupt the flow and the energy of the day. Um, and it's also respectful to them. They see it, but you know, when they see a camera, an old camera like this Mamiya 6, I think they react to it. They kind of compose themselves a little bit because it's a manual focus. It's a range finder. This is not snap, 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 snap. This is a very slow process. Um, uh, they react to it. They kind of show me what they want. I don't, I rarely art direct them, uh, but um, there's a little bit of respect there. They respect them kind of shooting with film and doing it properly instead of like it's just a cell phone snap. So this is also in Italy, it's the wood collector. And if anyone knows, anyone listens to music, um, think about Led Zeppelin IV, the album cover. I should have had that in the next presentation. <laughs> but the, this image, uh, that, that, that album cover um, is very similar to this. In fact, there was a recent article that came out that they discovered the provenance of the Led Zeppelin IV album cover. And a lot of people emailed me saying, isn't that, do you, didn't you shoot that image similar? Because it's uh, from Welsh, uh, this, is, this is an Italian image, but it's showing the rural experience and this sort of like this deep seated sort of stereotype in, in, in a good way, and, you know, kind of showing the, the traditional wood gather, gatherer um, harvester. Um, and here in Spain, there's this one festival that's the, the one of the more deep uh, um, festivals, maybe 120 different characters in a day. Um, and this is the straw man. Um, and a lot of these ones are, are really about nature. And here's the leaf man. Um, quite scary, um, but, uh, but fascinating. And these guys, um, they said to me, you know, I don't really care about Christmas. I don't care about New Year's. This event, the Vienhera, which is our carnival, that's what we prepare for. And, and it was especially uh, salient because the year I shot in 2023, they had not done it for three years because of COVID. So they were super excited to do it. There's like a real, real energy that year. And yeah, I end the, with Tree Man, uh, which is also from that same village. Um, you know, this guy said, all, all I care about is that it doesn't rain because I can't move otherwise. He could barely move normally. This is a huge, this is an actual wood. And, you know, <laughs> and so it was quite, quite intense. Um, so that's the, that's some of the images from We the Spirits. And, oh, that's the cover of the book, um, which is inspired by one of the, the Slovenian images. And I, I made a a gravure, a, um, a carving uh, in, in wood, and then I'd make prints. And then, so that's that's my cover art. And I'll just show you a little bit of the behind the scenes because I know this is a photographer group. Um, this is in Slovenia and you can see me sort of crouching down. And this is the guy that I saw during the parade. I said, please, I need to take your photo. And this is the image that, that came about from it. And one more before and after. Um, so as you can see, you know, this one, uh, the town was quite ugly. So I had to find a white wall. Um, and, you know, I have my digital there, but I'm shooting with the Mamiya, and um, this is the result. This is in Spain. Okay. So, you know, I have a book uh, just out this year, and I, I published it with Ghost Books. They're in UK, and I actually was, you know, lucky enough to go there. And, you know, how do you edit from, you know, 50,000, 100,000 images down to, I probably gave them 1,200 as a, as a wide edit. Well, we do it the old school way. We got together, we printed out the, the pages, we looked on the floor, we kind of laid them out. And you can see when you lay it out, we laid it out by spreads, right? So you can see those certain ones are are um, are by themselves, certain ones have left and right, recto and verso, and they have a conversation with each other. And um, they're quite brilliant in doing that. Um, and then I actually went on press in October in Italy 
And, you know, it's an intense experience because the, the presses are running. You've got to make a decision on color. Um, and, you know, we had a set of proofs, but, you know, when you convert from our, from to CMYK, um, it, it always has a little bit of a shift. So you really have to watch each color. And this is what one of the sheets looks like. And, you know, you could say, oh, well, well, this color I've got to change, but the whole strip of the of the uh, the images are affected by that color shift. So you really have to sometimes toe the line between two options. Um, but luckily, you know, the, the guys who operate in the press and my publisher, Gost, are expert in, in helping me with that. I wasn't alone. Um, and I had some success with it up, leading up to the book launch. Photo Lucida in 2022, I got top 50. Um, and I had a Geo magazine here in France, which is basically the Nat Geo of France. They published this and Wall Street Journal. When the book came out this year, um, they, they put it on their site, on their Instagram, all that stuff. Um, and it's, so just to say, it's quite good to make sure you you pitch um, the, the editorial side when you have a project like this. Um, and I've presented this work, uh, the first work of Flower in the Mouth. This is me presenting at Lincoln Center. Um, some years ago, but um, you know, seeing it projected and presenting it in this way um, is always fulfilling because it's a different type of connection than just in social media or or sending images or posting. Um, recently, I had this work um, exhibited in Germany um, from November twenty three till just recently Feb twenty four, and this is what it looked like. So, just to give you guys an idea of how it was laid out, um, in this is big, gorgeous space. I'm at 40 big prints um, is quite nice. And I did an artist presentation. So again, uh, just showing you kind of how people were reacting to it. Um, this is new work, a uh, new exhibit now, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's up in Hastings on Hudson at the Ted and Nuna studio. It's up through uh, May 19th. And actually, I just found out on May 19th, which is the closing party, I will be there um, in case you're going to come take a Metro North train. It's a nice little day trip, 45 minutes from the city. And just, just so you can show, uh, we had a couple of ideas here where we we pulled the three or four masks from my collection to show people. Um, and we have the books there and a little bit of intro. And, um, you know, just some, it's quite a nice studio. But, um, they have moving walls that's very configurable. And it's a very clean space. Um, and here's an image from the opening last weekend, an idea of how people were checking it out. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop the share. Uh, maybe you could do a screen grab if you want to. I think they're going to be sharing my website and Instagram and all that good stuff and where to order the book. Um, I'm assuming they've been sharing that throughout, or maybe it's in the link below. But um, that's pretty much the presentation of the images. Um, awesome. Do you have any questions, Derek, for me? I know we have a video potential oh, where, to show. Where but... do we start? I got a yeah, lot I know, of questions. Yeah, I know. It's a lot. It's a lot. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I love just just to kind of rehash my my personal thoughts is I love the the direction that you went with. Because what do we think when we hear Carnival? Most people think Brazil and only Brazil. You know, you you don't even make the tie of Mardi Gras. It's like Mardi Gras in New Orleans is something completely different. But a lot of people, especially in this country, you don't think outside of that. So to see like Slovenia and Austria and some of the other countries that were tied into it. Yeah. Um, it was intriguing. Eastern Europe is interesting. Yeah, for sure. And um, I mean, you know, if you, I say you, Derek, but at you, everyone who's listening, if you take away one thing um, that carnival is not just a party, it's this deep cultural, you know, thing with many different themes of identity and transformation and kind of, you know, carnival, it could be construed that during the, the day or the four days or the whatever weeks of carnival, you know, time suspends, the rules suspends, you're in this sort of transcendental, you know, other space. And I like to think that, you know, when I'm photographing it, um, I also join into that, you know, transcendental space and kind of you forget about everything else and kind of go into the moment. Um, and I like to I, I like to think that I photograph that way for all my projects, um, but especially I felt it um, in Carnival. You kind of look up and it's like, you know, five hours later, you don't know where you were and, and you know, all that. And some of the people share with me, you know, when I put on this oil or this mask, I kind of go into the zone. And I kind of forget what happens. And it's only when I take it off to I kind of return to becoming this regular human again. Um, I kind of want so to seize find on that, that to be a deep, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to seize on that. I love I love the idea of the duality of a lot of this stuff. There's there's contrast, there's juxtaposition in certain regards. And this idea of party versus cultural, how hard was it 
being an artist, obviously a visual artist, these are the things that we normally gravitate towards, right? We gravitate towards this, a party. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of, um, I guess it's, it would be like the clickbait of art. You see right. vivid colors and a lot of stuff going on. And we're so conditioned to be like, right. wow, this, this is so great. How did you exercise restraint or, or how, or where did you draw the line between party and not taking the bait, so to speak, to keep it to the cultural aspect? Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, to answer that question in a sort of oblique way, photographing carnival and these sort of rituals and costumes and masks is both, talk about dualism, is both easy and difficult, right? It's easy because it's visual. It's an, it's a, but it's difficult to differentiate yourself from many other photographers who are covering, usually journalistically. The way that I did that I think is because, you know, I showed you mostly portraits in mm -hmm. of this, of this new project, but every portrait that I photographed, every ritual I covered journalistically as well with digital fast, bang, 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 literally to learn about it, to cover it and to be in the moments when I could do the portraiture. Right. So um, with the portraiture, I abstracted it a little bit. I kind of took them out of that whole chaos on purpose but I tried to include some of the environment of the village or the town or the field or whatever it may be, because I have seen some photographers who bring a seamless, they bring three lights, a battery pack, an assistant, uh, you know, a, a wireless, whatever. And that's good and fine, um, but it becomes much more just about the costume, um, not necessarily about the place and where it is. So um, uh, how do I avoid being sucked into the party? I think, um, I think, for me, it was a little bit of the mental headspace of, yes, I'll get into the party when I photograph it digitally and do the journalism for me. But when I do the portrait, it becomes a quieter thing. And the the so the raw technical demands of using the Mamiya and doing a natural light and, um, you know, demanded that I kind of slow down and breathe and kind of make it a little bit more of a formal thing while keeping that. the same energy of the part, you know, without, and, and I, by keeping the same energy, I kind of, communicate to them that it's literally going to be between one and five minutes. Let's just do this real quickly. Mm. Um, it was difficult at first, but as I, I, I've become known in the sort of carnal community as the guy who goes around and does that. So now I'm, they're like, oh, we've seen your work on this. And, you know, yes, of course, come in. But before in the beginning, it's like, who are you again? You know, I had to like do a lot of things mm. of like, oh, hey, here's, you know, here's my last book or here's my phone showing the images, you know, that kind of thing to get access. You you went right where I was going to go with it because I figured there's there, with everyone having a camera now and so much being on travel photography and everyone's trying to go see other cultures because it's so much it's easier to do now. Um, I was going to ask that about differentiating yourself as you're there for a different purpose. You're there to capture a piece of the culture, not just to like you said. I love that the helicopter pilots that parachute in. You're there to immerse yourself. Now, how long do you typically? How long are you immersed with each uh, each community? It depends. I, I usually add one or two days before the things start to go have a look at the place, meet some people, have a drink with them. I bring my little Zoom uh, uh, recorder and I do interviews with them. Even if the interviews are not very good, it just shows that I'm trying to learn about the place. Um, and that helps me a lot to get access. Um, if I can't, if I'm just showing up, um, I, I could do that too and just kind of make mm -hmm. my way, but it's, it becomes more deep when you, and you show up in advance. Um, so yeah. Uh, but anywhere from a day or two, but in the, in the, in the larger carnivals, like for example, Slovenia, Galicia, Brazil, you know, I go weeks in advance, not when nothing's happening. I mean, Brazil, just to be clear, the actual days of the most intense carnival, I'm like not even shooting because it's so many people that you can't really move. Um, you go during the, in Portuguese, the Semana Supre, which is basically the, the weeks before, which is the same carnival stuff, but one-tenth the amount of people. So it becomes, you know, it's, it's um, you know, quite strategic. And you talk to a lot of people in advance and you do that by research, you know, talk to people in advance who've been there um, and they give you advice. They say, yeah, don't go this day because it's insane. Go these days before. It's the same thing, but, you know, or... Or especially in Europe, I talk to the, you know, either I'm connected with someone from the group who's kind of the 
bridge the outside world or uh, an ethnographer or someone studying them who knows them will usually connect me and they say, yeah, um, we're going to go at four o'clock, come here at 11 in the morning. We'll have a chat. We'll have lunch. We're going to get dressed here. And then you'll, you'll have like this slice of time to, you know, to say, okay. You know, and I often give back to the group by, you know, sending them some photos for their social media, or sometimes people request a print and I'll just send it along, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. Cause they're sharing their culture with me and they're, they're, you know, um, I, I, but I never make an appointment special with them to do that. It's this weird sort of like being flexible enough to go within their vibe, but me doing my thing too. A lot of it is just, I mean, kind of like the work of a professional photographer. You're, you're bending, you're fluctuating with the, the waves and the ebbs and the flows of, of what's going on from a, any given day. You have something, I mean, I'm get, there's a lot of preparation in mind, you know, and you, and you kind of have an idea of what you want, but you don't really know a lot of times what you're going to get, especially if you're experiencing, as you're experiencing new, new cultures. Was there anything that similarities, differences between the cultures and the countries? I mean, is it mostly celebrated the same? Is it like the same foundational aspects or is it each time you go into a new culture, a new country, you might get something different? And how do you prepare for any differences in that? Um, it's a yes and answer. Um, yes, they're all different. Um, each manifestation of the masquerade is slightly different and, or, but they're all the same. Also, okay. it's, it's a very, I see a lot of these similar themes happening, right? Um, number one, you know, whenever you masquerade, and this is a deeper thing, this is not just carnival. Um, whenever anyone puts a mask on, um, it, it kind of changes them a little bit. You know, you, there's a reason why in the States, all Halloween parties are a little crazier than other ones because people have, they, you reduce, you lose a little bit of inhibitions, you know, yeah. and that translates in a very deep way to, to carnival. Um, you know, people can make fun of their neighbor, their boss. Um, people can sort of, you know, um, they attack their friends, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but, you know, you ask the people, why do they do it, right? It's a similar thing of like, why do I do it? Number one is because it's beautiful, but number two, it's this like deep, it's this deep cultural expression of what it become it is to be human. And and their and it's an expression also of their kind of regional identity and like their personal identity. This is who we are, this is what we're doing, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, one guy told me in Sardinia, yeah, everyone always asks me, why do we do these crazy things? And he said, Well, you know, it's like asking, why do you love your mother? It's just like it's in your blood, you know, it's in your it's it's who you are. It's, it's like, why not do this? You know? Mm. Um, so that's some similar things. How do I prepare for the differences? Um, you know, every masquerade like this, um, there's a lot of sense of chaos. There's a lot of sense of, of, um, improvisation, you know, it's, it's not like come here at 11 o'clock and 1101, we're going to leave. It's just come in the morning and stuff will happen, you know, when they happen. Um, and so, and that's a universal that always happens that way, but how do you prepare? You prepare by also being prepared to be flexible to kind of, you know, do it on their, on their pace and their thing. Um, and you, you know, a lot of people say, well, you didn't speak the language of all these 15 countries. Of course not. Um, but I'm photographing a pretty proud thing. It's a pretty, it's a, it's a happy thing. It's a, they want to show it. It's, I'm not like revealing anything, you know, um, uh, intimate secrets or anything like that. Um, and I'm sharing that with them and I'm venerating, you know, I'm, I'm sharing with them that joy that they have. And they're happy to, when you have a genuine, like, like of what, of what they're presenting, you know, you could say that every portrait is a self-portrait and all this sort of deep things, but every portrait, you're sort of falling in love with that thing. Like you kind of say, Oh my God, I love what you're doing. Can I just go here and do this for one minute? And they say, oh, of course, you know, um, and, and if I don't speak the language, it's a lot of like pointing and smiling and like doing this. And is it okay if I, you know, and, and they're like, okay, you know, and some who say, no, they're doing, they're too busy or they want to do other things. Fine. There's a lot of things to photograph, you know? Yeah, definitely. I, I want to talk a little bit about your approach to projects more in terms of, you know, we always talk when we talk with artists, it's like, okay, well, when do you know a project is done? But I think there's an interesting nuance here where you went from a flower in the mouth to we, the spirits. So it becomes not just when do you know a project's done, but when do you know when a project sprouts an offshoot? 
and you could take it another direction. So I kind of just want to hear your approach to um, when a project is finished, when you, you know, when a one project kind of bleeds into another or when it is, is it two separate things? Yeah. Um, well, I think in my specific case, a flower in the mouth was a lot more journalistic and we, the spirits, uh, while I did a journalistic, the decision with my publisher and myself was to do only portraiture, which was the stronger um, set of images. And so I see them as they're not, they're an evolution and just, and they're linked in, in that it became, it became when I moved to Europe, it's like, okay, well, like, let's do more Europe project here. Let's do more carnival here. But then it became, as I looked at more work, here and seeing the European sensibility, I said, yeah, I want to make a, a sea change from this sort of rough and tumble port uh, photojournalistic thing to a more elegant monograph, fine art thing. So they are linked because they're linked by me and just how I'm doing things. But I also see them as very separate projects. Um, so when's the project done? Yeah. I don't know. I, you know, it's like asking how many photographs do you need? You know, every photographer, you need, you need more. That said, um, I think not to toot my horn that much, but when I started getting some critical feedback, like critical mass and, and, you know, people started like really reacting to the work and I wanted to do a book and um, it, it was an interesting um, sort of sequence that where got critical mass and it was announced like two weeks before I was doing one week before I was doing um, uh, portfolio reviews in photo fest in Houston. And uh, I sat down with them and that, that if anyone who don't know, it's, it's well worth it for the fine art. It's like four straight days of portfolio reviews. It's a bit intense, but you get like 20 meetings or 30 meetings, whatever it is. And of the 20 meetings that I had, 10 of them were critical mass reviewers already. So I had some momentum and people knew the work and um, then showing that getting a lot of good feedback and, and, you know, critical feedback, but good feedback. Um, that was in fall of 2022 and in the end of 2022 at Paris photo and back in Paris, that's when I met my publisher and he said, yes, we could do this. And I happened to during photo fest in September, I confirmed this big exhibit in Germany. So I think when do you know the product project is done? When you have these things that are like sort of stacking on each other, you know, you had like, and, 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 you know, publishers love, uh, if you don't know this already, photographers, publishers love it when you have an exhibit because it's a great compliment to the work. So he said, okay, you have an exhibit coming up in a year. That's enough time. Let's get the book done in, in time for the exhibit, which makes sense. Right. And so that's when I kind of knew like, this is when I'm going to launch this thing. Interesting. Now, yeah. you had mentioned, obviously, exhibits, books, publishers, that entire world. How does that affect the the creative process? How does it affect the way you go into photographing this project with what do you have? How much do you have in mind? How much is kind of set up, you know, as far as the layout? Do you see the final product or or do you approach anything differently, whether it's going to publication or whether it's going to be just, you know, edition prints? How does the, your mindset change based on the medium? You asked like four or five questions at once, Derek. <laughs> killing me. I'm, um, I'm, I'm like 10 kidding. minutes um, left. Let me squeeze them in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. And then go don't, whatever don't direction forget, you want to go with that. Don't forget, um, guys, I have a minute and a half video that we should show to give another flavor of this carnival so you, in case you see it. So after that, let's do this. Um, um, yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, you photograph differently and you edit differently when it's for a book or an exhibit or, you know, a magazine article, right? Um, and so thusly, you know, I'm always, I'm thinking of sort of all three things at once when I'm capturing in the field, right? Um, in the book, we have writing, uh, but we have it in the back because the images are front and center, but we have to make sure we have, um, in each image, there's a place and a title of the, the character. So people have an idea what that is. So uh, when I'm thinking about that, I'm making sure I note that stuff down. Um, and I learned that the hard way, of course, in my earlier work when I had to go kind of like scramble to go find that afterwards. Um, I got the book deal in, in the end of 2022 and I, and I said, okay, let's let's shoot some more Carnival. So I definitely shot it in a certain way and and really went intensely in 2023 um, to, do, to, to add more content. Um, but yet 
uh, even after the book was done, um, I photographed in Portugal in 2024 because I knew I had this exhibit and I wanted to add some new work to that. And in this case, it was the first year in which the villages reached out to me and said, oh, we saw your article and your book came out. Please come to my village to photograph. We invite you. And um, it happens to be that a village in an area uh, in Portugal that I'd never done, and it had been on my list, but I didn't have any access. So I figured, okay, why not? Let's just go. And it ended up being quite fruitful. It's like all these cork masks and crazy, you know, crazy stuff. I didn't include it in this presentation because it wasn't in the book. But um, uh, so I continue to shoot it. Um, I shoot it. I, I, I definitely shot it for the book towards the end. But um, I do the photojournalism also because, you know, for editorial purposes and for other different licensing purposes to have that to, to bolster the archive keep on you know adding towards that and so um i hope that answered the question i know you had four questions in there so um <laughs> i cut it down from six i, I was like give me in trouble I know, I know. <laughs> well look it, that answered it perfectly i mean it's it's really right. just about getting that insight in you know because everybody has their own process so it's it's always nice to see somebody who has worked from you know really developing out a project idea, seeing it through to completion and getting to that point of exhibiting it and, and putting it out yeah. there for public consumption. Cause I think and that's speaking the, of, yeah, yeah go, Sorry, ahead. go ahead. And speaking of exhibits, actually one thing that really popped to mind is a, like a major piece of advice. I think that I wish I had known in the earlier stages. Well, I did it, but which is um, in a project capture as many different types of content as you can. Right. What I mean by that is not just stills, but video, which we'll show in a second, doing the interviews, right? And I, um, which helped to provide a different context, not not only for the book, it's in the book in the in the sort of field notes, but um, curators and exhibition people love showing multiple forms of information. During that um, Germany exhibit, we had an eight or ten minute video of of which we cut down to a minute and a half for you guys, of of um, moving images from the field, showing some of the sound and the motion. And she loved that, that I actually had that already because it provides a different context, a different texture, different perspective for her viewers. And so that helps, you know, in my meetings and they're like, well, do you have anything else besides these photos? Yes, I have interviews, I have video, I have this, I have that, I have that masks, I have, you know, I have, you know, in the book, I have a the carnival expert, the ethnographer who helped me somewhat in, in, in some different territories, he provides a, a like a macro summary that I, cause I'm not a carnival expert. I'm just a photographer, right? I'm the bridge, mm -hmm. but he went deep, deep, deep into sort of like historical. And so having these additional aspects to your project really helps. So no matter what your project is. Yeah. And, so and with as that, we, let's go yeah, to the, that's yeah. a perfect, I was going to say, it's a perfect segue. And I think just as a, a quick parallel thought on that, is you didn't bring a video team. You're not a, a cinematographer by trade, but that didn't discourage you. And that that wasn't even a thought for just getting the content, right? I think a lot of uh, we hold ourselves back. It's like, oh, if we don't have a, a crew or we don't have all the gear that we might need or the know-how, we won't include yeah, it. Can I, you and talk? I go back to the music too. Like I'm primarily doing stills, but when I ever heard something that was really interesting, like bells or singing or or something that I'd be like, oh, let's just get it. I, I don't, you know, carnival is not really, it's a very analog experience. It's not mm. to be live streamed. It's not, it, but but um, there's a couple of things where it's like, let's just put aside the still hat and, and add your video hat and, and just get a, a little flavor and it's helpful for talks like this and in-person presentations because it provides um, a different perspective into the work so let's go. definitely there we go let's roll we're going to get to that quick you. little preview yeah. clip here and uh, i do apologize to everybody sometimes zoom does choke down the bandwidth so we hope it is a decent experience for you you can put that up a little bit
There's going to come a point where um, the neighbor is going to present the Mardi Gras with a gift. The reason behind the chicken chasing is because we're going around begging for ingredients, for the gumbo, for the Mardi Gras. That's Beautiful like one of my, that, that last one is, uh, I, I had to, I, people always ask, what's your favorite carnival? And I don't have one because I love all, all of them, but I really love those furry guys. They're in trauma and they're, they're fearsome, but also super cute and really fun. It's, it's funny that since you mentioned that before we close out here, when I was cutting together that the little short video and, you know, we had the clips we were going to show and I, I got it confused and I'd seen that at the end and I'm like, oh, I didn't know if we were ending it or if you were cutting that out. And I'm like, should I email him? It, I think this is such an awesome image. I'm like, I want to show this. And then I'm like, oh, wait, no, I got my markers wrong. It is in there. That's the one closing it out. So no, I, I second that. And I think, uh, you know, this is just great what you're doing. I think it shines a light on different cultures for people like me even who don't get out and go, don't get to see the world as much. And it really inspires people to go out and learn about other cultures. And especially from an artistic aspect, art is such a great bridge culturally to really introduce people to, to different things. So, yeah. And, and it's really, and it's, I, I mean, art and culture is really fun for me to document, you know, and it, you know, Carnival is just one, one big project, but uh, it's just something that uh, I've always had a passion for starting music and going to performance and sort of theater and these sort of things. Um, and so I hope that comes out in the work, but um, yeah, that that should do it but feel free to uh people to uh reach out on instagram or via my website with any questions further um and i, I think they posted they'll post in the, in the to follow me or to you can feel free to purchase directly um on my site either book um and uh yeah happy to be here thank you again jason uh it was yeah. nice to get you back and, and kind of tie the knot on this uh yeah you know i know we talked about it you'd been on to talk about it previously about the, the project before it was done but um it's nice to get, you know, get you on and hear the, the sounds and see the sights. And, and I think you do like that video at the end. It really does tie it all together. It doesn't matter how long the clip is just having some other experience other than the visual aspect. The sound adds so much to it. So I want to thank yep. you for this project. Sure. And for and just one last thing. Talk. Yeah. I, I just I, I just realized that just a small plug um, for those who are super excited to see the work in person printed large. Um uh, I mentioned it, but there's the I have a current exhibit in New York and Hastings and Hudson. It's at a Nuna studio. It's open Wednesday to Saturday from like noon to five o'clock um, from now until May 19th. And if you do want to meet me in person, May 19th, I'll be there during the day from 12 to five. Perfect. There you go. You guys have the information. If you don't need an excuse to go to Hastings on Hudson, this is a perfect excuse. It's a, it's it's a, a beautiful town, town. Yeah. beautiful town. Yeah. So huge thank you to Jason again and to all of our viewers out there tuning in. Make sure to check out those links. And if you are in the area up until the 19th of May, head over there and check out the gallery at Ted and Nunes up in Hastings on Hudson. But that is it. It's all we have. Another edition of the b Event Space now in the books. Catch you all next time. Take care.